Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the IFLA Town Hall. Um, my name is Vicky McDonald, and it is my great privilege to be the IFLA President for 2023 to 2025. Uh, today, I'm joining you from Brisbane, Australia, and it's 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So depending where you are in the world, uh, it's definitely going to be a different time zone. And I know that Sharon Memmis, who is joining us, is joining its um, breakfast time in, in The Hague. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming. This is actually the second Town Hall that we've conducted this week. Uh, there will be three in total and we'll also arrange for one of the uh, town halls to be made available uh, at the end of the week on the IFLA YouTube channel. So we are recording this session today um, as well. Um, just a reminder that if you'd like the translation, uh, we do have the Wordly uh, link for you and also this QR code which um, you can uh, click on and choose the language that you would like to listen in and the session ID is on the screen there as well. So do take the opportunity and I know that Stephen will add that link in the chat as we progress through the session today. So today um, I'll be taking you through a number of um, different areas of discussion, and I'm also joined by Sharon. So, um, Sharon, hi, thank you for joining us. Um, hello there, and I will say good morning from uh, The Hague, as it is in the morning, and um, just you can sort of watch me drinking my coffee, but really good to be here and looking forward to the town hall. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you for joining us. So if we look at the agenda for what we're going to cover today, there's uh, four key areas that we will cover. Oh, sorry, I've missed a slide off. I'll go back to the slide. So how we're going to work is really what we're looking to do is share some information with you, but also we it's an opportunity to respond to your questions. So we do encourage you to submit your questions in the question and answer um, uh, function at the bottom of the screen. You'll see there that you can ask some questions. We'll be scanning those questions to see where there's similar questions coming through and we'll prioritise the questions based on if they've been asked a number of times. Um, and I think, too, don't be shy about asking questions. If something's not clear to you, it's likely it's not clear to somebody else. So do take the time and, and use that opportunity and, you know, clarify things if, if something doesn't make sense. Um, because I know we're all here because we have an interest in the work of IFLA and ensuring that uh, we are delivering the best services to our members and our stakeholders, but also a commitment to our communities that we serve as as well. So uh, once again, thank you very much for your participation in today's town hall. So if we look at the agenda, um, there's four key areas that we're going to cover in today's presentation. Uh, Sharon's going to talk through a sustainable FIFLA, and it's quite a broad approach that we're taking to the definition of sustainability. I'm going to be talking about the IFLA Information Futures Summit, uh, which is now less than two weeks until it starts, and I'm quite excited about that. And we have a couple of key launches of key reports and documents at the summit. I'll talk a little bit about those. On Wednesday of this week, we have our next IFLA Governing Board meeting. Uh, that will be a Teams meeting, so online. Um, and I'm going to talk through some of the items that are on the agenda for the Governing Board meeting. And then finally, we've got some general updates. And of course, as I mentioned, the opportunity for some discussion and to respond to questions and answers in relation to what Sharon and I share with you today, but also um, any general questions that you may have as well. So um, the objectives of our session is really to ensure that you have the information that you need as IFLA volunteers and members in the work that you're doing for IFLA, uh, there's clarity around the work doing for you and but you're also aware of upcoming opportunities to participate in some of the activities that IFLA is conducting. And really, it's all about us all being better placed to work together to ensure the sustainability of our Federation. And as I've already mentioned, I'm aware that as members and volunteers, we each have a, a you know a significant commitment to the work of IFLA and the work that we do in providing library and information services across the globe. And really, also, our objective is that you do have the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have in relation to any of the activities that IFLA is currently undertaking. So I guess um, uh, why are we delivering these town halls? And they're very much part of our commitment to communicating better with our members and volunteers. Uh, just over 12 months ago, I gave my first speech as the incoming president of IFLA, and that was at the World Library and Information Congress in Rotterdam. 
And in that speech, we made a commit. I made a commitment, and it's been backed up by the governing board that we really want to strengthen our communication with members to ensure that you are up to date on the work that we're undertaking, but also giving you the opportunity to ask questions about what we're doing and to seek clarification. So, the town halls have been very successful in actually being able to share information, but we've also introduced a number of other mechanisms, and we'll talk about some of those as we progress through today's ad agenda as well. So um, as I mentioned, the first thing we're going to talk about is the sustainable future. Uh, and in my speech in Rotterdam, I did talk about the long-term financial stability of IFLA being a high priority for the governing board and, and for our members. Um, but also we're taking a, a very broad view of sustainability. It's much broader than just our legal and financial frameworks. And Sharon's going to share some of that information and thinking with you now. So I'll hand over to you, Sharon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Vicky. And yes, it really is um, tremendous to be here today. So um, my focus um, today is very much on sustainability. And I want to start by looking at where we are today. And I would say that, you know, IFLA first and, and very importantly, we are in a good place. Uh, we have a great member and volunteer base. We have a, an extremely talented and committed team in headquarters in The Hague. And we have an outstandingly good governing board. And I really want to take this opportunity to, to thank Vicky, um, the rest of the governing board, and indeed Leslie Weir, who's the president-elect and, and will be taking over from Vicky um, next August, for being incredibly supportive of the changes that we have been making in headquarters. So um, I, I think we have a really well-functioning leadership, if you like, of the organization at the moment, which is which is great. Um, and on a very sort of practical and concrete level, we do have, as we said at the General Assembly, healthy, solid reserves in the bank in case we have a rainy day. So I think we are in a good place. However, it's clear we can't just sit back and assume things will continue to go well. We have to look for the future. And there is really a pressing need to think about what our model will be as we head into our second century, because these things take time to put in place. At the moment, we are, um, as many of you are aware, over-dependent really on one funder, which is SIGL, as well as the results of um, our Congress. So we need to look at diversifying really our income. And again, just because we're healthy now, it doesn't mean that we can't be even better and stronger and healthier in the future, bringing in new sources of revenue so that we can support the field even better. And it's worth saying we're having some great successes already. We know we can be even more success, successful by better mobilizing. I think IFLA's absolutely amazing um, global network. It, it is, I think, a unique resource. And when I talk to anybody outside of IFLA, um, everyone is really interested and envious, if you like, of this incredible global network, that's so diverse across 150 countries that we're able to, to call upon, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think that we can build those partnerships because very much linked with our sustainability strategy is partnerships. It, it's not just about looking for different sources of income. It's about thinking of partners helping us deliver better for the global library field. And a couple of examples of things that we're already really good at, the advocacy team at IFLA are, are particularly strong at seizing new opportunities. And they've already brought in some new funding partners for this year and next year. So we know that we can do it. And our pipeline is very much getting healthier. And we're hoping for some even more positive news, I think, in 2025. So we are really, I think, in a good place. But we are thinking about the future. And that, I think, is the important point. Um, next slide. Just to remind you that we have now our AMBI status. So IFLA is officially a charity and I'm grateful to our members for helping us make those changes by supporting the statute change at the General Assembly. This means that we are now in Dutch law, a charity that makes us much more attractive for funders. Whereas before as a federation, had we received a grant, we would have had to pay a significant amount in tax and 
that's not an attractive proposition for funders. So now we are in a much better place for that. And we got that in July very quickly. So I think we're really set for the future already. Next slide. And what progress have we made so far? So our ambi status is, of course, just one part of the picture. And, you know, just like Vicky, I'm, I'm very aware of the need for us to act now in order to ensure that IFLA is able to face the future strongly and with confidence. And in fact, there's already a range of action underway. Um, so I've already mentioned that we're having some success and building a healthy pipeline of opportunities, but we have uh, commissioned some research into funding opportunities with a stronger focus on community. Um, what we're trying to do with that research is really look at opportunities that we hope our members and volunteers and the wider global field will be able to take advantage of. We've changed the way we're structured in headquarters and we hope that that is going to be more responsive to our members and also um, help us build that sustainability pipeline. The new strategy, those of you who've seen the drafts and, and have really sort of input into that, will see that we're now much more focused on outcomes. So not just about doing, but actually what's the difference that we're going to make. We've reframed the role of our regional offices so that they are now, we're trying to build up capacity in those offices as well to really help us in that partnership pursuit. And we're developing our portfolio of projects, always obviously in line with our strategy and our work. But again, um, you know, I, I'd like to, to really uh, praise the advocacy team led by Stephen Weiber because they're really expanding the projects where we're achieving impact, where we can develop that track record and attract new partners. And those partnerships that we're building through advocacy initially tend to start as more strategic partnerships, but can often become something else. So thinking about what the ingredients of sustainability are, you know, let's take a little step back. And um, I think the model of sustainability that we're working on emphasizes a number of key factors. As uh, Vicky said, it's broader than simply looking at the bottom line it's much much broader than that because we're not a business we are charity and federation and we are here to serve our members volunteers and the global library field and first it is worth emphasizing as we always do really that it's our members and our volunteer community who are absolutely the the foundation the beating heart on which we can build ifla's future without you we are nothing and of course, our membership fees are an important source of income, but it's also your expertise, your connections, the diversity of the field, the passion and the global presence. They are all essential ingredients in IFLA's sustainability plan. And the second key area is our ability to mobilize, to deliver what partners, funders and others are willing to support. Libraries do matter. They are transformative institutions and change lives in the communities that they serve. And libraries can be the essential partner in so much that partners want to support. So IFLA as the global organization for libraries can help connect and mobilize libraries globally to de deliver really transformative change. And there are also our links with other partners. And we believe that there are many opportunities to ensure that the library field and so our members and IFLA itself are seen as credible, high impact partners for the delivery of projects. And through our advocacy work, we need to make these links. We also know that there's a demand for training, support, events and other activities. And we're keen to explore opportunities with you. It's also why when we talk about sustainability, we also talk about partnership because partnerships, and I would say equitable partnerships, are at the heart of our sustainability strategy. And I really can't emphasize enough that we're not out there to compete with library associations or institutions, but rather collaborate, add value, and strengthen any potential partnership opportunity. 
Beyond this, um, we of course are also focusing on leadership in the library field and in our HQ team. And one of the most important actions anyone can take for sustainability is really to invest in the people who will lead us into the future. So I think to summarize, we need to play to our strengths and to celebrate the work with the things that make IFLA unique. And we are unique as the global organization for libraries, but we can only do it with your support. And this leads us to a number of if you like exam questions that we're working to answer. Um, looking at areas such as, you know, really refreshing our membership offer. Um, what do members really want? How can we strengthen it? How can we help our volunteers and others connect with the great opportunities out there that exist? How do we build partnerships, develop services, and how do we support the leaders of the future? These are the ongoing efforts, but ones where we will be engaging you because in the end, the most important partnerships that we have are those with our members and volunteers. So what can you expect to see? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got some research publications that will be coming out and um, funded generously by, by SIGL. Um, and those publications that research is looking into library field structures, project delivery, as well as an evaluation of um, BSLA, um, building sustainable, um, stronger uh, library associations and leadership programs. We're engaging with the regions on partnership mapping. So we've um, commissioned some research to look specifically uh, to begin with at MENA and Asia Oceania. And we'll be meeting with our regional offices. Stephen and I will be going to Singapore and um, Doha um, this year. We are looking at new policies to meet standard funder requirements. So what we mean by that are the, if you like, the due diligence policies that anyone requesting funding from a major donor has to have. And we're gradually producing those and we will be sharing um, those on our website um, over the coming weeks. These are policies that you will be able to look at and adapt to your own needs um, if you're looking for partnerships. And we'll have um, very much a strategy. The new strategy that we launched in Brisbane is very much focused on achieving sustainability based on the delivery of IFLA's core missions. So what do we need from you? Well, <laughs> we need data, we need information. Um, and I, I can't really emphasize enough how important it is that um, when you see yet another survey coming from IFLA, that you don't think, oh no, not another one, but that you answer it. It's such useful information that's how we're shaping our, our strategy. That's how we shape um, the, the RLIC review. It's incredibly important. And I particularly encourage um, our members and volunteers from regions where we perhaps have slightly fewer members, MENA, um, parts of um, Asia, and also parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have fewer members to really make your voices heard and complete the questionnaires and encourage your colleagues to do so as well. Um, we also want your input to identify partners. Um, you know, we need to look at how we can work, how we can seize international opportunities, if you like, and how we can work with you to take advantage of those opportunities. So we, we're very keen to help, um, you know, really get you helping us identify the partners. And I think there's the ongoing engagement, which um, you know is is incredibly important because IFLA's uniqueness, as we say, comes from its ability to really bring together libraries globally, and it's that global dimension which is so important. Um, and you know, really, just to repeat what I said at the beginning, at the end of the day, the most important partnership is with you. So do please join us in this process. Um, thank you very much and um, welcome any questions either now or at the end. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Sharon. You certainly covered a lot of information um, in that section. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions. Or, um, so I do encourage people if they've 
anything pops into the, um, what they'd like to ask about, please put it into the question and answer, um, and we can uh, come back to it at the end of the webinar as well. But for the moment, let's move on. And um, the next section that we're going to talk about is the IFLA Information Futures Summit and also some of the launches that will occur at the summit. So we'll just wait for the slides to come back. Um, here we go. So the, the, we'll be talking about the Information Futures Summit and we'll go to the next uh, slide. It's actually the, the front page of the summit's website. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to have a look at the site, I do encourage you uh, to have a look. So the URL is 2024.ifla.org and I know that Stephen will put that in the chat for you as well. So in less than two weeks, we'll be welcoming uh, people from over 65 countries to Brisbane, Australia. Uh, for the IFLA Information Futures Summit. So this is our first summit, which is focusing on the future of information and the role that libraries can play in that future. And uh, we have a really strong program. So the slide here is actually the top, top part of the screen is actually um, an image of our central business district. The convention centre is over on the left. Um, the State Library of Queensland, where I'm located, is on the left um, near the river as well. And you can see that it is quite a beautiful city, very easy to walk around, and uh, certainly really looking forward to welcoming so many IFLA colleagues to Brisbane in September in Brisbane, which is an absolutely beautiful time to be visiting our city. So let's have a look at what we will see in the program. Uh, we, as I said, the, the theme of the conference is information futures. We've got a really strong uh, program of speakers and the speakers come from within our own sector, the library and information sector, but also from outside the sector. And I think that's one of the strengths of our conversations and the debates that we'll be having over the three days is bringing so many people with diverse experience and knowledge to the discussions. We, as you will know, we're currently this year undertaking a review of our World Library and Information Congress model. And this summit is providing us the opportunity to try some innovative formats in how we bring people together to throw around ideas and come up with discussions. So uh, we'll be very intrigued to see how the response is to these different formats and it'll be part of our review process as well. Certainly looking at different opportunities to share and engage information, uh, and that will be through panel sessions, Ignite Talks, Fish Bowls, uh, which sounds quite intriguing in itself. Um, um, but really um, bringing people together to debate the issues. There's certainly a real focus on leadership, and that's how we lead through our libraries, how we can be critical institutions in making a difference in our communities and the broader society as well. And trends to practices is looking at the seven trends that will be uh, launched on the first day and how we actually implement them on the ground as well. We're really excited, too, to have a contingent of leaders from across the globe joining us in all of these discussions, so emerging leaders, and that has been funded by Sigil as well. So we do thank Sigil for their really strong support of the work that we're doing in this area. As I mentioned, we'll be launching a couple of key reports at the summit. The first one is the IFLA Trend Report for 2024. As you may know, we've um, IFLA's been releasing trend reports since 2013, but this report is the most comprehensive review that we've done in over a decade. And uh, it's been terrific to be working with Professor Michael Deswani and Dr. Kim Osman from the Queensland University of Technology. They've done a great job at looking at the trends um, in relation to information and knowledge across the whole globe and have really focused on ensuring that we do have that diversity of reporting in the trend report as well. Uh, and Michael and Kim will be uh, in the program on the first day. We'll launch the trend report and then we'll also have a panel of experts from within our own sector to respond to the trend report as well. So I'm particularly excited about the trend report. Um, I'm going to be using it uh, in the library where I work um, as well for our, our strategic planning session with my library board. What we've already re released is our literature review and survey. So these are available 
on the website. The literature review, I think, is a really great format as well. It outlines the seven trends. It talks about the opportunities and the challenges of each trend, but also gives us some questions at the end of each section, which can be used to prompt discussion and dialogue within your own library or your work groups as well. So the full report is launched on the first day of the summit on 30th of September, and it will be supported by uh, scenarios and tools and learning materials as well. So it's a real suite of, of publications that will be available to you. And we have some experts across the world at the moment currently working on the scenarios as well. So that is a, an exciting aspect of this whole trend report. It is quite a suite of resources that will be available to you um, as well. We'll also be releasing the new IFLA strategy, and that will be on day two of the summit. Uh, and of course, the IFLA strategy is an important visioning document that guides the work that is led by IFLA across the four year period. It certainly informs the work of the IFLA team in The Hague and the work that they do at a global level, but it's also used to inform the work of our many sections and advisory committees as well. The strategy itself has been very much influenced by input from our members and volunteers. You may recall that in the last 12 months, we've conducted six surveys, we've had five consultation sessions, and overall, we had over 2,000 responses from our members and volunteers. So that has really played a critical role in influencing the development of the strategy. We also had several discussions at the IFLA Governing Board as part of the development of that process. Um, and of course, these, this strategy is an important strategy. It will take us through to our second centenary as a federation and, and really helps to build on the work of the global vision that we have also been progressing. So here we have a slide, which is really the, the strategy on a page, a slide, uh, and you can see the structure of the new uh, strategy, our new vision, sustainable futures for all through knowledge and information. And I, I always think it's really good to have a very strong, succinct vision and one that you can remember. And, and that's certainly what I know we're all about is, is futures for all through knowledge and information. The structure of the strategy as well is uh, three impact areas, which you can see there, um, and also an enabler, which is around future-proofing IFLA. And we've already had a lot of discussion today around the importance of future-proofing and ensuring that we are a sustainable federation going into the future. And I know that's something that is really important to our members as well. And of course, it really builds on the work that we've done over the last uh, six years or so in the UN's 2030 agenda. It very much sits at the central part of, of what we are about as well. And you can see when you look at those impact areas, we're really around a professional communities connected and energised, libraries as valued partners, and, and Sharon has talked a lot about partnerships being critical to our work today and making meaningful change as well. And I guess that's really a, a key, key aspect of sustainability is our continuous change uh, as a federation and, and delivering services as well. So quite excited about the strategy, and I know particularly that many of our sections are looking forward to its release as they it will inform their work in developing their action plans uh, from October onwards as well. At the summit, we'll also be releasing the Brisbane Declaration, and it really builds on the Leon Declaration, which you may recall from 10 years ago, uh, which really has a focus on the importance of knowledge and information. And the declaration will really be embellished by the insights from the summit as, as well. We will release the summit, the declaration rather, the draft declaration at the commencement of the summit and then encourage delegates to build the declaration over the three days and as they reflect on the discussions and the, um, the presentations that we have across the three days of the summit. Moving forward beyond the summit, the Brisbane Declaration will then become a really important advocacy tool as we work with our members and also our stakeholders and potential partners in uh, progressing the work of IFLA as well. So a really, ex I think, quite an exciting outcome from the summit as well, so that we leave the summit knowing that we've actually documented our key thinking from the three days and it enables us to then build on it and leverage that as we move towards the future 
as well. So it is um, it's something I'm very much looking forward to. We've spent a lot of time over the last uh, 10 months, I guess, in preparing for the summit. And it's really fantastic to see that we have um, representation from over 65 countries. I think we'll have over 700 delegates, which is a really strong performance. So I uh, do encourage you to have a look at the website. Uh, there's the URL there, 2024.ifla.org. We'll certainly be releasing a lot of information in all of our newsletters and emails and social media as well. We'll also record both the opening and closing session and make those available on the IFLA YouTube uh, web uh, channel as well. So, so stay tuned for more information in relation to the summit and the outcomes of the summit as well. So now we wanted to just move on to some general updates around the work that is being progressed. So I guess we've we've certainly got the work happening around sustainability, the planning and delivery of the summit, but of course the work continues on so many other areas as well. So there's a number of upcoming opportunities for you to participate in the work of IFLA. And if we just move to the next slide, I think. There we go. Um, so, oh, well, first up, we do have the governing board meeting tomorrow. Um, and there's, you can see quite a lot on that um, meeting agenda for just a two hour meeting. We will be launching the elections process for 2025. So as you know, every two years, we have elections for all of our sections and standing committees, uh, special interest groups, and of course, the governing board. So the governing board will be approving the timeline and the process at the meeting on Wednesday, and we'll share that information with with you fairly quickly. It is now less than 12 months until the next Congress in 2025, which will be held in Astana in Kazakhstan. And the National Committee has been already progressing a lot of their planning in relation to the delivery of the Congress. They've provided us with some options for the logo and the theme. So we'll be making a decision about those on Wednesday. And I know that people are always really keen to have this information as it um, it contributes to their planning as well. We also know that actually having a forward plan of Congresses is really important. It enables the host uh, countries and cities to progress their planning, but it also enables our sections and committees to be doing their planning as well. So what we will be uh, working through at our governing board meeting on Wednesday is releasing some expressions of interest and seeking uh, uh, I guess, interest from cities and countries to host uh, the Congress beyond 2025. So we will be asking across a multi multiple years for um, interest from that. And then following those, we'll also be having some webinar sessions uh, where interested nominees can explore what's involved in delivering a Congress. The Professional Council has made a submission in relation to their review of special interest groups. As you know, special interest groups generally have a finite time, and so they've done some work, consulted with uh, the sections and the SIGs themselves, and made some recommendations. So the, the Governing Board will review those as well. Sharon's already talked about uh, our focus on sustainability. And one of our key objectives is to have a sustainability strategy approved at our December governing board meeting. So we'll receive an update on the progress of that work and the timeline for progressing. At every governing board meeting, the finance director always provides an update on our budget, uh, how we're tracking against our proposed budget, and also we'll be talking about our 2025 budget um, and doing some of the preliminary work on the planning for what work we will deliver in 2025 and the budget as well. So you can see quite a full program uh, for discussion on Wednesday. And of course, following the, the meeting, uh, we'll be sharing uh, an email through email with you the outcomes of the governing board and particularly focusing on any key decisions that have been made. And, um, you know, I think it's been fantastic that this year we've been able to share these updates in the, in the languages of IFLA, uh, which has actually made the communication much easier and strengthened our communication. So thank you to the IFLA team and they've been supported also by our language centres in enabling the communication in, in languages as well. And I know that it is particularly valued and appreciated by our members and volunteers as well. 
And then if we move to the next slide um, is the upcoming opportunities. Um, so there's certainly many opportunities for you to be involved in the work of IFLA moving forward. As I've already mentioned, we've got the Information Future Summit in less than two weeks. We currently have the IFLA Volunteer Survey, where we're really interested in finding out what what is um, prompts people to become volunteers, how they're engaged, what value they have for being a volunteer, and what influences them in making those decisions. We'll have some announcements about the election process and the timeframes, and also um, a, a special membership offer uh, for people to join uh, IFLA and to get some extended benefits in relation to the time that they're a member as well. October, we'll be uh, kicking off the nominations process, but also conducting some surveys on connectivity, intellectual freedom activities in library associations. These surveys are really important because they help inform our policy development and strategy development. And it's really a good, um, very quick way for us to actually see what is happening around the world as well. In November, uh, we'll be hosting events in Buenos Aires and San Diego, and I know that our LAC members are particularly excited about the opportunity to come together uh, for those events as well. And then before you know it, it's the end of the year um, and December, and the governing board will, of course, meet in The Hague in the second week of December. At that meeting, a very important paper to be discussed is the outcomes of the review of the World Library and Information Congress model. And this work has been led by President-elect uh, Leslie Weir, and she's been supported by three very um, active uh, working groups as well. So this is a really important paper to be considered at the December meeting. And Leslie will also provide an update on the review process at the summit as well. So it is one of the sessions um, that is being delivered in a, in a fortnight's time. And we'll also have some initial reports related to sustainability. So you can see across the next uh, three months or so that's left of this year, there's quite a lot of work that's being progressed. And uh, I particularly thank the, the team at the um, at IFLA headquarters in The Hague because they're, they're moving a lot of work at the same time as, as we're delivering all of these summits and, and meetings and things like that as well. I think we go to the next slide. Um, this is really my report card, I guess. Um, when I um, when I took over the presidency in Rotterdam, I outlined uh, a number of priorities for myself as president, and it's been fantastic to have the support of both the governing board and the IFLA team in progressing these priorities. So you can see there's six priorities there, um, and I'm very proud to say that each of those is on track, and you will have seen through the communications over the last six months the good progress that we've made on each of those priorities. So... Uh, the first one around financial sustainability, which Sharon has outlined today, and of course, achieving AMBI status was certainly a significant milestone for us as well. Uh, the IFLA strategy, 24-29, so we will launch that in a fortnight's time, and it will then inform our work going forward um, for both the IFLA team, but also our uh, committees as well. The trend report, had, there's been a lot of work progressed and led by Stephen Weiber over the last six months in ensuring that we have that trend report ready to be released in a fortnight. But also I think what's particularly important about the trend report is it will become a very effective tool for us to progress our discussions and advocacy work moving forward. We've had a very big focus on being a well-functioning governing board, a focus on stronger transparency, and that is around communicating the work of the governing board, but also our decision-making and the information that we're sharing. So you would see that our minutes of all our meetings are available on the website. We have the very timely um, response uh, email sent to everybody in relation to the outcomes of the governing board and the decision as well. And that, again, links to our fifth priority around the clearer communication, the new formats, uh, the town halls and, um, and end of year membership campaign as well, which I just mentioned as well. And our sixth priority was reviewing our Congress model. So we've updated the term of reference for the Willick 2025. I think there was much more clarity around what we were seeking as a federation when we asked for people to put to respond to the EOI, and that will carry through in our review as well. But as I mentioned, we've also have the recurrent review of the model progressing, and that's being led by Leslie 
and the report on the review recommendations will come through to the December meeting. So certainly a lot a lot of work progressing. This dashboard is also available on the IFLA website as well. So you can uh, have a look at that as well on the website as well. So I think that concludes the slides that we wanted to share with you today. Uh, and it's an opportunity now to respond to questions in relation to anything that we've talked about, uh, but also um, anything more broadly that IFLA is, is currently undertaking. So I will give you a, um, a few moments to uh, enter your questions into the, the Q&A button. Um, and we did get a couple of questions earlier, um, so we can response, start with those, I guess, as well. Um, so one of the questions, Sharon, was around, does IFLA offer research grants for member libraries? Um, would you perhaps respond to that question? <clears throat> um, I, the answer, I'm afraid, is, is no at the moment. Um, we do offer some grants. So we have grants to travel to uh, Congresses. So uh, a number of people have uh, been able to take advantage of that and actually get to Australia. Sigil also funded some Emerging Leaders grants this year. Um, so we, we managed to do things like that. I know it's one of the areas that we are going to explore because it is a, a, a great idea and perhaps as generally part of our sustainability plans. And also now that we have AMBI, we can, we can begin to think about looking perhaps at getting some sponsored grants and donations, um, some and seeing as we as we move forwards whether we could we could do that but that's a great idea would love to be able to do it um but it, it's not immediate watch this space we'll try in the future yeah and i think too a number of the sections have also been sponsoring and providing grants in relation to other activities as well which has been really uh, quite useful as well there's also a question around initiatives related to reading and promoting reading. And I know that that is something that many, many of us in the profession are really concerned about is, is um, people aren't reading enough um, or, they, or the only reading they're doing is on their iPhone. Uh, in Australia, I know that it is an area that has a lot of focus, uh, particularly at a local and state government level. And many of the state government libraries, uh, state libraries are working with their public libraries in promoting reading and and um, particularly in those first five years of life, which is really foundational to um, your development as a human being, and 90% of your brain growth happens in those first five years. So I know there's a lot of focus on that in a lot of reading programs. And it is also a topic that's going to be discussed at the summit. Um, we've got some latest research from Australia Reads, uh, and we also have school librarian debating around um, the, I guess, the... Uh, competition for time and and re and particularly how we get people to read for recreation, not just for their work as well. So, I whether you want to comment on that particular question, Sharon? Uh, no, I mean I I think you you know you you've covered it. Obviously, it is a, a fundamental part of what IFLA um, does. So it it it, it really. I think you can weave it through everything that we're doing. It is at the heart of it, and I, I would say that that perhaps in the um, particularly in the advocacy space as well. Uh, I, I think maybe I'll ask Stephen to say a few words because you've been doing quite a lot, um, particularly around sort of manifestos, our partnerships with um, UNESCO, etc. So perhaps um, you'd like to just mention, uh, talk a little bit about that. Yes, uh, 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 absolutely. So I, I think, as, as I said, this is such a core issue and, and I think it's, something that we certainly look to argue has to be kept front and centre as we talk about issues around broad information literacy, around digital literacy, that fundamental literacy in reading is, is sort of the first step towards all of these wider objectives. So making sure that as, as, as we focus on these wider things, on, 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 on these sorts of skills, we don't actually forget to keep the focus there. Um, we know there's some very interesting work going on in Latin America in particular between libraries and regional organisations looking at how we can make sure that libraries are getting involved in, in literacy and reading strategies. And so really making that, that connection and, and thinking about how we can mobilise libraries to deliver systemic change and really see libraries as an infrastructure for policy delivery. 
And that's got a lot of potential actually to provide a model for how libraries can be infrastructures for delivering a whole range of different goals. I think look, looking more at information literacy, we have an interesting possibility right now with the United Nations Global Principles on Information Integrity. Um, these really open quite a useful door to a more holistic look at questions around how we address fake news, misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, um, not just by playing whack-a-mole, um, not just by going after the, the, the negatives when bad things happen, but actually how you build a more holistic, comprehensive, people-centered strategy for a world where people can access and can make use of reliable, accurate information, verifiable information. So I think there's an opportunity in there and, and we, we will be in touch and giving ideas about how library associations, national libraries, others can really try and take advantage of this being on the agenda in order to highlight what they can do and hopefully really launch some interesting partnerships. So a lot of those topics as well are explored in the literature review for the trend report. And I guess we'll also, there'll be a lot more um, in relation to the trend report when it's released as well. So since we've got you as well, Stephen, there is another question around uh, the key global developments for open access um, academic publishing. And I can see that Fiona Bradley is on the line, so she would have been perfect to respond to this, but unfortunately we can't. We can't um, bring people in, but um, and I know that Fiona is leading a panel session at the uh, the summit in relation to open access as well. But did you want to respond to that that particular question? Yes, no, ha happy to do so. But of course, I, I do encourage everyone to take a look at the um, pages on our website for the mm -hmm. Open Science and Scholarship Advisory Committee. Fiona's recently put up a, a really good. Um, update on on the work of the committee and it's one of our newest it's only been around for a year or so but it, it's really sort of showing its value it's it's showing its importance and it's showing that we probably should have done this years ago so um that, that that's a success um i suppose in, in terms of broader trends i think one of the issues is always that that, that publishing and open access it goes in different directions in different parts of the world for different financial and cultural reasons but I think especially since UNESCO's recommendation on the topic a couple of years back there's really started to be more of a global discussion a desire to exchange between regions I think a, a really interesting step has been the um, rise of the intensification of discussions about diamond open access so um, this is where neither the authors nor readers need to actually pay so it's finding business models that allow that uh, and, and that's a, a model that, that's really been led by um, people in what would be called the Global South, um, but is, is of interest elsewhere, given the, the flaws in the gold open access model in particular and the risk of that being exclusive. I think um, other areas of interest at the moment are discussions around secondary publishing rights. So introducing in law a possibility for people to republish works on open access repositories regardless of the deal that they've signed with publishers so that provides a way of getting around some of the limitations that agreements with publishers can can present um i think there's a some interesting questions always about culture and how to get over the idea that that something being free means that it's worthless um and there's always that need to build on the culture and not necessarily just impose that on on researchers um so just a couple of other quick in areas that are of interest at the moment. Certainly, I think the rise of AI is posing some interesting questions about um, how far people want things to be open. Um, I, know, I think from our perspective, there is a risk that heavy handed regulation of AI could lead to um, problems, could actually undermine some elements of open access. So there's a I need to go into these things with eyes open, but in particular to make sure that AI does not lead to, uh, the regulation of AI does not lead to restrictions on, unnecessary restrictions on research, just in the same way as we also act to prevent negative outcomes from AI. I suppose the final thing is that it's been very welcome to see in the Pact for the Future, the big UN document that should be agreed this weekend, that's actually talking very explicitly about open science being a key ingredient of development. So it's very good to see open science appearing on that UN level and being integrated into wider talk about development. And that's really the first time we've seen it appear in that sort of document. It doesn't get cited in the 2030 agenda with the SDGs, 
but it does in the pack for the future. So hopefully that gives us a, a useful basis. Thanks, Stephen. And I guess a good reminder for us too um, that there is a lot of information on the IFLA website itself in relation to the pages for each of the different advisory committees and sections there. They, they all do a fantastic job of, of putting up information on their activities, but also the news items also have a lot of information around uh, the advocacy work and, and where IFLA is, is representing the library and information sector at the different UN sessions and things like that. So um, uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I think, yes, we haven't got any more questions and I see we're almost out of time anyway. So, but of course, a reminder, if you do have any questions in relation to anything we've talked about, do encourage you to write to IFLA at ifla.org um, and we'd be happy to um, to respond to your questions as well. And thank you, Stephen's just provided the link to the advisory committee as well if you're, you're interested in following up on any of that information. So as I mentioned uh, in the session, we do have our governing board meeting on Wednesday. Uh, and we will provide the outcomes of that meeting and in any decisions that have been made uh, in an email to our membership later this week as well. So uh, thank you. And um, I, I can see looking at the list that I can see many of the people who are on uh, the call today, I'll be seeing in two weeks here at the summit. So uh, thank you for joining in today. And uh, I do look forward to seeing you in a fortnight's time. So Thank you very much. And uh, and thank you again for coming uh, along to the Town Hall. We do appreciate you um, making the time to find out what IFLA is currently doing. So thank you. And thank you, Sharon, for joining us today. Thank you very much as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this, today. And thank you, Vicky and Stephen. And thanks, Stephen, for being uh, managing all the controls and making it all work. So thank you. And, and answering questions <laughs> unplanned. So thank you very much. But thanks, yeah. everybody. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.